Okay, <laughs> let's do what we can do. I always feel so frustrated. I think I adopt subjects that are too big to, to deal with. And I'm so keenly aware of how much we just have to skip over and ignore. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move ahead. We did, uh, we did pretty well. Oh, and there's, oh, well, we got a crowd now. Okay. <laughs> are, are you in Charlotte somewhere? I am. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, we've, behind. I'm in Charlotte. We've got a, we've got a far flung crowd here. And he's um, in South Carolina and you're in Charlotte. So, oh, we, my goodness. We covered a good deal of territory last time to get Jimmy Carter launched. We did his childhood. Uh, his young adulthood. Uh, we got him into the to the, the Navy and noted his, uh, well, m maybe the, the more important one or two things to remind us is, is how he was born and in his early years in a community of predominantly African American. So he had all of this early experience of being really immersed in a small country crossroads town uh, of African Americans. And also, we noted the the uh, the strong influence upon him of uh, Rachel. Uh, what was her name? Rachel. Uh, well, anyway, the the African American woman who cared for him a lot, kept him, who worked in the home. He spent time in their house and so on. And he attributed to her being a major moral spiritual influence upon him. Said she got more along that line from her than she did from either of her parents. Anyway, he goes on and he has this uh, happy career, happy childhood, productive childhood. Uh, we should mention to his school teacher, Julia Coleman, uh, who was also, she taught English for about grades five through 11, you know, she, and she was a brilliant, brilliant woman. And uh, he, he gives her a great deal of credit for influencing and shaping his life. Anyway, I won't try to summarize any more of where we've been before because we've got more to look at. Uh, and we're going to start today with uh, his 39th birthday. He's, uh, he's in Plains now. He and Rosalind have reconciled. She, she, she hated leaving the Navy and coming back to Plains, but she's, she's reconciled herself to that. And she's been a key figure uh, in the business. And at, at this point, they're sort of middle, middle age, would you say, age 39? That's young or middle, middle age. And, and they've prospered. The business has prospered there. He's a prominent citizen in, in Plains by this time. He's a deacon in the church. He's worked on the school board. He's been chair of the school board. He's well known. He's uh, been pro very prominent in the Lions Club and various and sundry associations. And they live in Plains now, which is uh, a more urban place than archery there may be 600 people in plains so it's it's the uh, it's the <laughs> urban center of this and he's uh, 39 and uh his his wife uh, rosalind notices this is on a weekday morning he's putting on his sunday go to meeting clothes he's not putting on his work clothes and so she asks what what what's going on well, he had decided to go down and register to be a candidate for state senate, which would take him to a, a town, uh, the name of the town for this misses me for the moment, but without any discussion, apparently, without her being aware of it, he has decided to take this, his, uh, you, you could say his first major step in the politics. Uh, being with the school board was something of a quasi-political position too, but this is a, First time to run for office. Uh, age 38, I made, made that point. We won't dwell on this much at all, but the writers, the biographers always, you speculate what, what was the state of his ambition at this relatively young age? Was he looking toward the presidency or, or something higher than state, state, state senate? Uh, we don't know. He kind of decides it. No, running for the state senate was took a big stretch of the imagination. He says in his mind, but uh, it was a pivotal event in his life. It was a complicated election, and I won't go into it at all. But there, there were some stolen votes and some ir irregularities and illegalities, 
that defeated him and he had to fight against that and there were a lot of legal tussles. Anyway, he gets elected to, to the state Senate. And this is uh, this next period of his life, which would be uh, 1962 to 1966. He ends up getting reelected. So he spends about four years as a state senator, which takes him, takes him to Atlanta uh, during, uh, during the middle of the week. And he begins to get into another, another world, a more urban setting, of course, and a more cosmopolitan kind of setting. He is, um, uh, one writer says that at this point, there were two things that were firm in his mind and heart that sort of stayed with him and carried him on into politics. One was the conviction that he was the best candidate in, in, in whichever setting. He really believed he was the best candidate. And he also believed that if you worked hard enough at anything, you could probably succeed. So he was, he, he was already, of course, a, uh, I won't say workaholic, but he worked very hard at what he was determined to do and where he was determined to go. And that pattern was uh, established both in his race for the state Senate and then as, as his work as a state senator. <coughs> Uh, he promised the voters when he ran that he would read every bill that was introduced and considered in the Senate, which was an absurd commitment. Nobody then or now. <laughs> if any of you know anything about legislation and legislators, you know nobody reads every word. Every, but he, he vowed to do it, and he felt obliged to do it. I think he took some... Uh, I think this, it was at this point he took some courses in speed reading so he could get through them all. And he was very, very earnest in, in what he did. He worked on issues uh, relating to education, uh, some issues relating to the environment, and uh, also some things related to the organization of state government. I won't say much more about this uh, this period, uh, the, what, what all he did in the legislature, but he, he was determined at it. A couple of things during this period in the state legislature, um, well, maybe as a generalization, let's say he focused not on national issues, of course, but focused mainly on serving his own uh, constituents. Uh, I mentioned education, healthcare was something that he gave attention to uh, during this period. After the first two years, he ran again and was elected. One of the stories, one of the episodes of particular interest to me and to us um, is that he began to read some theology during this period. He'd always been a Sunday school teacher, but uh, I'm not, not sure exactly who gave him the reading list, but he, he ordered books from major uh, theologians, leading voices of the time. He read something about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote, read some Kierkegaard, uh, who were some of the O.L. Well, Paul Tillich. Uh, more importantly for him was Reinhold Niebuhr. He had a friend in Atlanta, a lawyer, a political activist, who was also something of a lay theologian. He was a a prominent member of the Presbyterian Church. And he and Jimmy had a lot of social concerns in common and had a friendship. And uh, his name was William uh, Gunter. Well, one night, uh, William Gunter invites him to his house for dinner and Jimmy goes for dinner. And Gunter shows him his, his library. And it's, it's just enormous for a lay person to have this kind of library, including a, a large theological section. And Jimmy looks at it. He says, my gosh, you got more Bible and theological books in your library than we have all kinds of books in our public library at Plains. Well, this man Gunter was very well read and a serious lay theologian. And when Jimmy left that night, Gunter gave him a book uh, called Reinhold Niebuhr on religion and politics. And that book, which I've read, I have, everybody who's uh, interested in Niebuhr has it and uses it. It's a compendium. Chunks of this book, chunks of that book, a chapter here, a chapter there, put together. It's really quite a, um, 
a wonderful piece of literature. And Car Carter takes it home. And about two nights later, he calls Gunter. He says, this is the most amazing stuff I had ever read. Now, uh, not everybody finds Niebuhr easy, easy to read or understand or to appreciate. All this is especially relevant to me because I had a slightly similar experience with Niebuhr 10 years later after Carter. Niebuhr is so good at interpreting the relationship between uh, Christianity and, and politics. And, and uh, Carter was, was, was struggling with, he struggled with all kinds of theological issues, but struggling with that particularly. How do you apply this, uh, this, strength, this ethic of love for the neighbor uh, you can see how you apply to that to somebody you know or who you're in contact with and so on. But how do you, how do you apply that to the clump, complex world of politics where the choice is never between love and unlove? It's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. You, it's, it's a conflict between groups. And to get anywhere, you have to get a number of groups on board and behind it and so on. Anyway, I'm not altogether sure what uh, inspired Carter so much by the writings of Niebuhr, except uh, Niebuhr's, to put it very simply and oversimplify it, that the way you implement love in the political sphere is to usurp for justice. Justice is not the same thing as love. Justice is something less than that. Justice has more to do with balancing powers between groups in society. And all of that was apparently very helpful to uh, to Jimmy Carter, he felt, I think, some personal conflict because he'd always, he always has a strong conscience. And as we talked about in the first time, he, he learned the Bible. He got a lot of Bible verses. He got really got a, a good head full of uh, New Testament and prophetic literature. But how do you, he also knew, he knew himself well enough that there's, there's a lot of personal desire well, greed's too, too not is a bad word, but personal ambition. How do you how do you reconcile this strong personal ambition with this ethic of love, and how do you get that mixed in with the uh, political uh, struggles? And Niebuhr helped him with that. And you'll you find if you follow his story, he, he he very frequently and often in speeches and in interviews and so on refers to Reinhold Niebuhr as his. Uh, his favorite, his favorite theologian. He got a lot too from Paul Tillich because Tillich uh, had a lot to say about the role of doubt in the life of faith. And that was a big issue for him. He had his doubts uh, about many aspects of uh, traditional religion. And for this major theologian, Paul Tillich, to recognize that that wasn't necessarily a negative thing, but something that belonged to it. Anyway, he doesn't write or say much about that, but he says enough to know that that was an important thing to run. Um, so that's one thing to say about this four-year period in the state Senate. He had a little more time to read and think. He was going to Atlanta during the weeks, and he had private time there because he had to still, his business was still going, and pretty Rosalind, I think, mostly ran the business during during this period. He'd come home on the on the weekends. Uh, the other thing that happened uh, in 1965, th things were going on in the civil rights movement, of course. Students were sitting in, uh, freedom riders were riding over, and uh, some of the activists were visiting churches, black students visiting white churches to see what their reception would be. So most of the churches had to figure out what they were going to do about that when somebody, a, a young black man, presented himself on the front porch of the church. And uh, the deacons in Carter's church had a meeting to discuss what was their policy about receiving African Americans into a service of worship. And the deacons decided the policy would, would be not to admit them, not to allow them to come in. They're just there to cause trouble anyway and make a splash and so, and so on. Well, Carter was out of town. Uh, he were attending a funeral several hundred miles away, so he missed that meeting, the deacons, but he insisted that they bring the issue before the congregation, uh, which they did. They had a congregational meeting. Uh, we would call it uh, a meeting and conference, church and conference meeting. 
and it was well attended, a couple of hundred people uh, from the Plains Baptist Church had the meeting, and Jimmy Carter introduced the resolution that we receive anybody, regardless of race, etc., cetera, uh, welcome them into our, our worship. Well, there was a some discussion, I'm not sure how long they discussed it, but what they, it was certainly tense and somewhat heated. He got six votes for his proposition. His vote, Rosalind's vote, Lillian, his mother's vote, uh, and one of his children, one of his boys was at the meeting. I guess two of them were, and he got those two votes. And then one other man, one man voted for it who didn't know what he was doing, <laughs> it turned out. But this was uh, a big thing in that setting for that time. Some of the, many people didn't vote. Some of them later in the evening after the meeting called him and Ted said they appreciated what he was doing, but just felt that they couldn't stick their neck out on this. Well, here's a man with status in the community. He's rising in the esteem of the community. So this is a problem. They, they, they survived it, though. Uh, some people didn't speak to them at church for a while. Uh, Jimmy didn't resign from the church. Somebody asked him why he didn't resign. He said, well, I, I can't resign from the human race. We've got discrimination all over in the human race, and I'm a member of the human race, and I'm not going to resign. And so I'm not going to resign from my church. And at that point, he didn't. His, he uh, adopted a strategy of staying with it, offering what influence he could within the in the context. Anyway, these uh, these events uh, and others that we talked about last time gave Jimmy Carter a, a very low. He began to be perceived as being a little out of the mainstream, not quite loyal to Southern ways and Southern understandings. Uh, nigger lover, he was called that, and his wife was, um, but not in any huge way. In the main, at this point in Carter's life, he's, he's not an open public advocate of racial justice. He's not a pusher for school desegregation. He's mainly a quiet, non-expressive, but these few little incidents that some people picked up on uh, gave him something of an image of not quite in line in terms of Southern ethics and so on. But he still remained a leader in the community, prominent in the community. He lost some customers, they lost some friends and so on. But it wasn't a huge kind of uh, move. So uh, I guess that the fact that he could survive such things led him to decide to run for governor. 1966, run for governor of Georgia. This is a, a pivotal event in his life, of course, and I'll just skim over it. The situation, of course, you have to win the Democratic Party primary first in Georgia at this time. That was the key to getting elected is to get the Democratic nomination. So the, the, the primary race was, was within the Democratic Party. And there were three other candidates one was a man named Ellis Arnold, who was uh, a prominent figure in democratic circles and was known to be somewhat progressive. And usually that meant on the race issue. Progressive meant you were uh, deviant on the race issue. The other, another candidate, the second candidate was Lester Maddox. Now, do you all remember Lester Maddox? Lester Maddox was a famous, colorful, blatant, clownish, vigorous segregationist. He ran a restaurant and he had a, he was famous for running blacks out of his restaurants with a, a, an ax handle. And then the ax handle sort of became the symbol of his political career. So he was the other, he was the other candidate. And Jimmy Carter's stance 
was not to the left of Arnold, but to run in between Arnold and Maddox. And uh, so he threw himself into that, uh, that campaign. Uh, now this is in 1966. So just remember where we were, Lyndon Johnson, John Kennedy, then Lyndon Johnson, things were moving nationwide. And Jimmy Carter defined himself not as an LBJ Democrat, but as a Dick Russell Democrat. Now, Dick Russell was, he'd been senator in Georgia for many years. He was well-respected, very powerful, uh, also a clear segregationist. So Jimmy says, I'm not an LBJ that is pro-African-American. I am a Dick Russell Democrat. Now, this the quick, that gives you a little inkling as to where he was morally and or, or politically. Anyway, he ran a very vigorous campaign, worked his tail off as he was prone to do, and lost. He lost big. And Lester Maddox won big. Now, they had to do a, 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 a runoff between Maddox and Arnold. And if you were advising Jimmy Carter, you would tell him to support Arnold, wouldn't you? He was the more liberal of the candidates. Jimmy Carter refused. He didn't endorse Maddox either. He just, he just withdrew. And it just, he was stunned. He was absolutely floored. He didn't believe that this was possible, that Georgia would uh, elect above him and others, uh, this fellow like this uh, Lester Maddox fellow. And he went into a period of deep, deep depression, clinical depression. He had a psychiatrist uh, friend who also served uh, his mental health needs some, in some ways, who declared he was clinically depressed. A long period of uh, uh, introspection, uh, feeling bitter, uh, mad at God. He confesses he was a mad at God. How could God let this happen? How could the voters of Georgia let this happen? Uh, he was very disappointed, also deeply in debt. He, he, he was well-to-do financially, but he didn't have money to cover this kind of campaign. He'd lost 22 pounds. Now, he was a little guy to begin with. I think he never weighed much more than 160. Uh, but he lost 22, just the physical exertion. He didn't sleep much. He'd go to meetings all over the place, uh, thousands of speeches, and so on. And as I say, went through this period of feeling really very, very down and angry. Some of his anger was direct, directed toward God. I could not believe that God or Georgia voters would let this person beat me and become governor of our state. Well, I'm, he, he wrestled with that probably for a year. Somewhere in that time, he, he heard a sermon. You don't often hear about sermons uh, triggering significant changes in people. About this time, the pastor of the Plains Baptist Church preached a sermon entitled, If You Were Arrested For Being a Christian, Would There Be Enough Evidence To Convict You? <laughs> Clever <laughs> sermon title. You can imagine well how that was a pretty catchy uh, approach to use, and you can imagine what the content would, uh, would be like, or at least some of the kind. But he was, he was quite stricken by this. He began to examine himself. You know, he thought, well, you know, I've always thought I was a Christian, always. He didn't say pretend, but I tried to be and thought I was that I made Christianity the primary thing in my life. But but that's really not true. I just been mostly serving myself, uh, serving my own career and so on. Uh, another another thing that happened to him during this period of depression, he had a sister, Sister Ruth who had become a kind of Pentecostal style evangelist. She'd had some terrible difficulties in her life, a bad marriage, I don't know all the details, but she'd had a period of deep depression. 
and and somehow had found her way out through something like a Pentecostal experience. And the uh, sources I have says she went to divinity school. I can't imagine what divinity school she went to, but nobody's, I can't find that, find that out. But she, she'd become a speaker and a writer. I never heard of her before, but uh, the writer, the, the, my sources say that she was widely read in certain in certain circles. So she was almost famous. She was from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Anyway, she visited him during this period of depression and uh, she wanted to uh, help him out of it, of course. And she had a, a religious or evangelical message for him. I talked about my awareness of Christ. Ruth, Ruth, that was his sister Ruth, talking about her talks with Jimmy. She went and lived with them for several, I don't know, a week for a period of time. I shared with Jimmy how it was to come to Christ. And I shared uh, and to place and to a place of total commitment, the peace and joy and power it brings. And she she remembers this this kind of talk brought him to tears. Uh, he, he later on said, no, it didn't bring me to tears, but he didn't deny that it moved me. Carter remembered, urged, urged him to learn. Ruth urged him to learn from his disappointment, to understand his loss as a summons to spiritual maturity. Maybe God is trying to get to you through this failure and through your depression and you're falling flat on your face to to some, you know, some other kind of understanding of, of these things. She suggested that he was ready for a, some kind of transcendent religious experience. Uh, Jimmy says he rejected the notion eventually, but eventually he embraced it or at least embraced something like it. Well, of course, there's been uh, a lot of uh, interest through the years as just what exactly the nature of this experience was. And there are several different accounts of it, not, con not contradictory, but different kinds of expressions. The tra this transcendent moment occurred the year following this election loss. And Jimmy wrote or said, I recognized for the first time that I'd lacked something very precious, a complete commitment to Christ, a presence of the Holy Spirit in my life in a more profound and personal way. And since then, I've, I've found a peace. I've found some inner conviction. I've found some assurance that transformed my life for the better. Uh, another place he puts it this way. In 1967, I realized my relationship with God was a very superficial one. I began to realize that my Christian life, which I had always professed to be preeminent, had really been a secondary interest in my life. And I formed a very close, personal, intimate relationship with God through Jesus. So, uh, uh, that became obvious, obviously from his own confession, a, a turning point in life, in his life. And he doesn't always through his whole life talk much about this, but in later days, uh, biographers and reporters, you know, have asked him about it. And this is pretty much uh, what he said. Okay, next step. Along with this, uh, he sort of gets himself back together again. He gets out of his deep depression. He gets and he gets reinterested in politics and reinterested in running for governor again. And the next uh, piece here is is this uh, second campaign to become governor of Georgia. It was bound to be an uphill fight. He was not well known statewide. I mean, he was well known in his county and in his town uh, and the county seat there too, but not statewide. So it was going to be an up, uphill fight. He had some friends and supporters then who helped him think things through politically and would help him campaign. And they decided and he decided to conduct a fairly aggressive campaign. And he was going to be running against a man named Carl Sanders. 
Sanders had been governor before, but in Georgia, there's a limit. You can just serve, you can't serve a second term in sequence, but you can run again. Sanders had been pretty successful governor. He was pretty, pretty well supported by the newspapers and by the political actors and, and so on. And he was somewhat progressive. He was a little bit of the left, to the left for Georgia. He was also wealthy. So Carter pretty well decided to run a kind of populist campaign, appeal to the common person against the wealthy and the classy and the educated. But don't pander to racism. That is, don't be an overt, vigorous racist. Don't become a George Wallace quite. Uh, so he tears into Carl Sanders. Cufflinks Carl, he called him. <laughs> Cufflinks being a sign of upper class, snooty. He's appealing mainly to rural and small town white folks who it, 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 it turns out that Sanders, so far as I can find out, was, was not a bad guy. But Carter said some things about him that sounded, accused him of making money from while he was in office and uh, doing some illegal things. None of that was ever proven and uh, it didn't, uh, it really wasn't, wasn't po popular. The, uh, now what I'm trying to say now, Carter's campaign develops not as an overt racist, but with a racist, racist tinge. And with a, a very populist appeal of us ordinary folks against the, the wealthy and the well-to-do and the high-class folks in it in Atlanta. The newspapers all preferred uh, Carl, Carl Sanders. They're, they're one, of the, one of the more nefarious things that's reported has to do with a photograph of Carl Sanders. Carl Sanders owned a part of the basketball team there. Uh, okay. The Atlanta Hawks basketball team. And they'd won some big tournament, sort of like last night. They'd won a big tournament. And they were celebrating in the locker room after the tournament. And they had champagne. And they were pouring champagne on uh, the owners, Sanders was the owner of the, of the Hawks, and some of the team were African American. So somehow that picture got in the newspaper, and the Carter campaigners got copies of it and put it in a, a folder and disseminated it around the state. Well, what it was supposed to convey and did, he's, he's, he's among the wealthy class, he owns a basketball team, He's associated with alcohol. They're pouring champagne, throwing champagne around the room, celebrating with alcohol. And he's got all these African-Americans around him. And furthermore, they let it be known that Sanders had attended the memorial service for Martin Luther King. Carter hadn't attended, didn't consider it. Yet. So, uh, it sounds pretty racist certainly a, a strong racist flavor. The, uh, and it paid off, just to skip over a lot, of, a lot of the details. Carter won. He won the primary, and he finally won the, the general election. It was not too hard to, the Republicans didn't have much to go, go against him. Uh, there was another piece of this, this campaign. Uh, there was a leader of the White Citizens Council. Roy Harris was his name. He was, he was actually one of the founders of the White Citizens Council. He lived in Atlanta or somewhere in Georgia. I forgot where he went. And he was, of course, explicit, definitely a racist. That was his reason for being. Carter visited him. Now, nobody knows what they said, either of them, in that visit. But Roy Harris came out and endorsed Carter. Well, Carter won. He got the white, rural, small town, working class vote. And that was, that was sufficient. He also worked his tail off. Nobody overworked Carter, says one reporter. Uh, 
Cufflinks Carl Sanders and other politicians gave the impression they were entitled to the election, but he attained his goal. But he was very uneasy about it. He, he was conscience stricken about it. Uh, associates noted that he, he was not ebullient. It was his goal. He wanted to win it. No doubt about that. He never denied it. And in later years, Carter acknowledged, but never as full as you might like for him to acknowledge uh, that racism had helped had helped him get elected. Carter got most, uh, his opponent got more of the black vote then. There was a, Vernon Jordan's a name some of you may know. He became a black leader uh, during the Clinton years, head of the Urban Council. He was active in Georgia at that time. And uh, he was president of the National Urban League. Carter said to him, uh, you won't like my campaign, but you will like my administration. What did he mean? You don't like my campaign. Well, there's a lot written about it and some good, interesting stuff written about Carter's motives, what was in his mind and so on. But the big, big moment came when he was inaugurated January 1971 biting cold, uh, cold temperatures. Carter took the oath of office, 76th governor of Georgia, Naval Academy band played anchors away, so on and so on. Carter steps on the podium to deliver his inaugural address. Sun poked through the clouds. At the end of a long campaign, he said, right from the start, I believe I know the people of this state as well as anyone. Based on this knowledge of Georgians, North and South, rural, urban, liberal and conservative, I say to you quite frankly, that the time for racial discrimination is over. Now many of his supporters felt a stab in the back. The applause was not not very loud. There probably weren't many blacks there, but they didn't they didn't know at this time who Carter was, except this vaguely quasi racist politician. Time for racial discrimination is over. Uh, this is the bomb for Georgia, and in many ways uh, for the country. Uh, Carter, uh, sifting through his years of having taught Sunday school, we haven't said much about that because everybody knows he taught Sunday school from the word go, including his years uh, at the Naval Academy. He appeared to revisit the campaign in this inaugural address. He was telegraphing his regrets. I realize he said that the test of a leader is not how well he campaigned. In fact, forget about that. <laughs> Don't focus on that. But how effectively he meets the challenges and responsibilities of office. Our human charity and our religious beliefs will be taxed to the limit, he told his fellow Georgians. But no poor, rural, weak, or black person should ever have to bear the additional burden of being deprived of the opportunity of an education, a job, or simple justice. That phrase simple justice is a Niburian phrase that just became embedded uh, in his mind and heart and in many, many, many of his speeches. So he's, he's announcing a new direction and it wasn't just words. He indeed begins to inaugurate uh, this new direction. Now he had hoped that the press, who was covering this, uh, would recognize his references to the campaign and his modest expression of regret about the campaign. But no, that's not what the press picked up. The press picked up the bright side. We've got a new, a new kind of governor in the South. We've got a brand new day in the South. Things are changing, and they're changing big. They focused upon his this opening statement about the time for discrimination 
is over. Uh, they referred to him in the press as a New South governor. Some of you remember that uh, phrase being used. The New York Times, uh, front page New York Times, probably the first time the New York Times had ever covered the election of a Southern governor. Anyway, uh, they pointed out that the new governor delighted blacks in the inaugural audience by making an unqualified call for the end of racial discrimination and so on and so on. Uh, about uh, shortly thereafter, Time Magazine did a big cover story and the headline was Dixie Whistles a Different Tune. So the national media picked up on this new type of Southern leader, new type of Southern governor and so on. And he began to implement things uh, that confirmed that, that image. Prison reform was at the top of his, I'm sorry, we'll name now a few of his uh, progressive, we would call them progressive measures, prison reform. In the New Testament, he, he talk, talked about Jesus characterized his followers as those who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, healed the sick, visited the prison. He believed that improving the criminal justice system in my state will be, could be my greatest contribution as governor. And he did a good deal to reform Georgia's prisons at this time. Added more education programs, treatment programs, uh, increased the numbers of uh, mental health and, uh, and uh, psychological counseling systems in the prison and so on. His, his big, big mark, and this is not unrelated to it, of course, was in race relations. He appointed dozens of African-Americans to policy positions in parole, uh, law enforcement, examination boards, university system. He called for the peaceful integration of public schools. They were still struggling with school desegregation. And he began to take some leadership and intervene in some uh, situations to move in the, in the direction of, of justice and desegregation. He developed a close friendship with Andy Young, Andrew Young. You all know Andrew Young was a right-hand person to Martin Luther King, eventually became Congressman, United Nations representative, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, very, and mayor of Atlanta, very prominent black leader, got to know him uh, during this period, developed a friendship with him. Uh, Leroy Johnson was the only black senator in Georgia at that time, called Carter the best governor for African, African Americans in the history of the state. Benjamin Mays, president of Morehouse, African American leader, uh, said that Carter, among all the governors in the state's history, your name stands among the top leaders. Uh, so Car Carter is now Carter is now joining the civil rights movement. For 18 years, he'd been back in Plains. He had been a public man for 18 years, kept his distance from the movement, almost totally. Uh, Koinonia Farm was down the road. He kept his distance from Koinonia Farm. He didn't go to Martin Luther King's funeral. Uh, he didn't support the Voting Rights Act. He spent 18 years building his family situation, his business situation. He did some small things on the side. But uh, shortly after, the, a, a little later on one occasion, Coretta Scott King introduced Jimmy Carter and explained he was not a part of the movement, he was a product of the movement. And Carter was clear himself about that. Uh, now he's a governor, he hails Martin Luther King as a, a hero and someone who helped save us all. He, uh, he did a lot of symbolic things. Well, one thing he'd do when, the, when he would go to a country club meeting somewhere, now when you're governor, you have a cadre of uh, drivers and guards, and he always took African Americans with him. And normally they'd stay outside or in the car. He'd bring them in and insist that they'd be seated as he was at the main, main table. So he did a lot of sort of small stuff uh, like that. And he announced that they were going to hang portraits 
of prominent black leaders, historically prominent black leaders in the, in the state house in Georgia. The first one was a, 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 a big portrait of Martin Luther King hung in a prominent position in the state house. They had a big ceremony about that. They had the Ku Klux Klan there protesting it, but anyway, it was done. And then there were two others. There was a Henry McNeil Turner, would mean nothing to you all, I think, but he was a prominent African-American Episcopal Bishop. Uh, and then there was a woman uh, named Lucy Craft Laney, who'd been a, a well-regarded uh, African-American woman school teacher, had portraits of, of them hung, hung in this place. Oh, well, he pushed, uh, pushed better education programs. He had a program called Adequate Program for Education in Georgia, provided money for vocational training, reduced class size, equalized funding among school districts, is constantly calling attention to the gaps between the rich and the poor uh, in Georgia and elsewhere. It increased the, the budget for the Department of Natural Resources. He becomes, uh, when he's a president, uh, environmental protection becomes huge, energy conservation becomes huge. That starts here during this period as governor. A lot of money goes into natural resources. He gets laws passed to stop the building of BAMs dams to preserve rivers and and so on and so on. He's also supports a uh, oh Lord, oh Lord, Lord, we're running out of time as we always do. But these these are the generalizations about progressive reforms that he pushed and in, to some degree succeeded in getting done in 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 Georgia. He was also a uh, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment was being debated and discussed at this this time, and he he got into got into that. There was one kind of uh, they never did pass it in Georgia, but they they worked on it. Both he and Ro Rosalind did uh, on a nationwide basis. I was in the office of a state senator here in North Carolina, lobbying for the Equal Rights Amendment one day back in the seventies. And while I was in his office, he was a good guy from Charlotte, and he was mild and progressive, but he had some political debt, so he was against the ERA. He was going to vote against it, not enthusiastically, but he felt obliged to. The telephone rings, and he saw Jimmy Carter is on the phone and wants to speak to him about this ERA effort in North Carolina. And this guy, Marshall Roush was his name, he just he just lit up. It was interesting to see a, uh, a state legislator just light up. Car he's calling from Tokyo. <laughs> I don't know what Carter was doing in Tokyo at the time, but here he is in Tokyo lobbying for ERA in North Carolina. It, it didn't change his vote. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him afterwards, no, we still going to vote against it. But uh, the, the, the other story along this line is at, at one point, Carter was speaking to a an anti-ERA anti rally. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing speaking to such a rally, but he was and explained that he was for the ERA. But he added that uh, unhappily Rosalind was not. Well, this was reported, and Rosalind was mad as fire. She was for the ERA, <laughs> so she she rounded up a couple of coworkers, and they put on their ERA buttons, and they called Carter and insist she called him and insisted that he take them to lunch, and which he agreed to do it. He took them to lunch, and he said. Uh, to get him, get him straight that she was for the Equal Rights Amendment. He said uh, later that I'm glad nobody had a tape recorder in the car <laughs> to record what she said to me during that, <laughs> during that drive to lunch. Anyway, that wasn't the major thrust of his administration, but that was a, uh, it was a piece of it. Well, it's, I, I think we've got one minute left or a half a minute. <laughs> Somebody want to quickly add something. We're, we're about finished, I think, with his, uh, his, his governorship, his four years governorship. He really became, he was born again when he was elected governor. And you could have a lot of interesting discussions. Was it justifiable to 
have a just a slightly racist tinge to your campaign he claimed he never knew about that photograph that was showed the his opponent being doused with champagne by african americans i don't know he, he had a kind of there was a kind of dirty tricks committee whether he knew about it i don't know but uh anyway Collins, it's there so, is. it's so hard to break off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there's yeah. so much yeah. I want to yeah. say. I'm thinking about FDR and Eleanor as a kind of a parallel couple. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um I I've been tasked with making sure that we finish in time for people to get on their pantyhose and get to church. Um, and or, or whatever they need to do. I've been instructed to stop at 9 30, so okay. I'm tasked to to do that. Oh, okay, well yes. uh Thank we'll we'll so pick much. it up we'll pick it up from there. And Thank we're not you. gonna cover everything. We're not gonna get through all we might like to get to. Okay though, thank y'all for coming. Thank you. And for praise this the gift. Lord for the machinery after throwing us a curveball <laughs> yes <laughs> and i hope stephanie didn't have a total collapse when she no, was told she that the roof that the roof was falling in <laughs> she remained cheerful throughout which oh really well, there's a christian attitude <laughs> uh, gonna say, <laughs> well we didn't remain cheerful well i guess we we remained okay all right peace go to church praise thank the lord you. thank, thank you, you.